Hi everybody, welcome to Photographer's Coffee Morning. We're here again with Tom Barnes. This is part two of last week's interview. We had a few technical hiccups that the eagle-eyed amongst you might have noticed. If you didn't, then great, fantastic. But in the meantime, Tom's graciously volunteered some more of his time to talk to us. And yeah, let's get straight into the chat. Bless you, gracious. I don't know about that. No, I, I, it's always a pleasure, Tom, you know that. Yeah, it, it, and honestly, it, it was a really fun chat last time and I wanted to make sure we didn't miss anything. And one of the big topics that you kind of mentioned before was how stressful it had been like you've, you've been through this enormous round trip with equipment and you've gone from canon via every other brand and then eventually back to canon and it, it kind of got me thinking while i was editing the last edition of the podcast like just how, how big of an expense these things are and how little really high value information is out there about these changes and ultimately as you said that it didn't matter in the end like for you that the kit that you started out with would have been absolutely fine for the entire journey but I do think that there's kind of like a huge opportunity here for you to share some of that insight because I went through exactly the same thing as you started out with Canon when I first started with my career and went all around the houses, went to Canon mirrorless and now I've moved again to Fuji and it's exactly like you said, there's an awful lot of money spent with not necessarily an, an incredible amount of return for that, for that money. But I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about the way that the cost of becoming a photographer is changing because I think camera manufacturers are now targeting prices very differently. Um, a few years ago, you could buy Canon's like Premier L lenses for like a thousand pounds. That was like the price point for a lovely 50 millimeter 1.2. Whereas now that same optic is going to cost you two and a half thousand pounds. How would you kind of summarize that process? Obviously, every time you moved, you must have felt there was a reason to do that. So what was it that prompted you to start that change? Do you want me to summarise the um, summarise the whole experience? That sounds pretty good to me. Let, let's let's give them an overview. It was bullshit and an utter waste of time. Like I, I honestly, I'll, I'll be I'll be super honest with you. I wasted thousands, and that 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 is that is you know bluntly, there doesn't seem to be much brand loyalty now. People seem to be very happy to just jump between systems, and it's you know not as a direct result of me but there's people like me who are jumping systems left right and center and making making it maybe look quite cheap well actually it's not it's hugely expensive you lose thousands and more importantly what you do is you lose the familiarity with your tools and so that i think set me back i would say two or three years and interrupted my career at a really important moment and i will regret it for the rest of my career so if you're thinking about moving systems, you better have a really good reason. And and going, oh, I need mirrorless. That's not a good enough reason. I mean, yes, mirrorless is great. But like, honestly, the, you you most likely do not need to change anything about your setup. What you need to do, and which is what I learned, is maybe buy a course or spend hours on YouTube really fine tuning and learning how everything works. You know, I used to sit on, but in the early days of my career, and remember when you used to get those fat manuals? So I used to sit on the loo, sorry, graphic image. I used to sit on the loo and I would just lose myself in the manual. And I'd be like, cool, okay. And I didn't used to like, you know, doom scroll or, or do anything like that on Instagram. I would look through the manual. So you know, I knew the Canon 5DS and the 5DSR and the 5D4, 3, 2, and 1. I knew them inside out. And I never did it with the R5. I know the R5 inside out now. But when I moved to mirrorless, I didn't go Canon to Canon because at that point, the Canon uh, offering wasn't very good. So I, oh, what did I do? I went, I actually went from medium format. So I went Canon up to, well, Mamiya Leaf, then back to Canon, then Canon to phase one, and then phase one to Fuji. I, mean, I talked about this in the, in the previous bit. I went, I went, basically, I've owned everything but Panasonic. Honestly, hand on heart, I'll even put my hand on my heart, wherever it is. It's been such a catastrophic waste of time and money. But when I was doing it, it was easier to do it because it was slightly cheaper. eBay fees, for example, weren't so high. And the secondhand value that you would be offered at places would be slightly more generous. And also, I was very good friends with my local London Camera Exchange. So, and I have business accounts at Wex and CVP and, you know, all the, all the companies. So I would never, ever pay full price. And I would never, ever accept the lowest value. So I was always kind of like getting a good deal because, you know, when you do a system swap, you'd be buying a huge amount of equipment and they want to sell that in one go. So I would normally get thousands off a big system swap. If you're buying two bodies and three lenses, you'd be surprised at how much you can actually get as a discount. That said, I regret every single change. 
and I regret the medium format purchases the most. You see, this is something that's interesting to me because I, I, I agree with you. Like, I think making consistent changes without knowing where you're going to be and what you need is, is, is stressful. And there's kind of an addiction that comes with learning something new and feeling like grasping the technology is, is the thing. But I think we've both come to the realization that it really isn't, that the point is that you need to be familiar with the kit, you need to engage with your subject matter, and that's the most important element. But let, let's say that we, we need to use some of these mistakes to benefit other people. If, if you were a new incumbent to the industry, let's say that you were, you were in a studio and you've just left to go freelance, so you've got skills, but you don't have kit, where do you start making a decision? Because all these camera brands are trying to advertise to you and saying, oh, you need this, you need that. Where do you start? The bit of advice I wish I'd been given most early on in my career, what is it you need? What is it that your style, what is it that you, the way you work needs? It's not what you want from a camera. It's what you need from a camera to enable you to create the work you want to create. So it's not like, oh, you know, so when I went and bought the medium format system, I was just like starry eyed because I could like, I could afford a phase one and I could buy a phase one. And like, that was like the, the piece de resistance for like anyone, like all the big commercial shooters. I always saw them shooting on phase one. I bought a phase one. It was the worst camera for me. Absolutely the worst camera for me. You know, I shoot really quickly. I'm moving around a lot and I'm then the autofocus could not, the camera just couldn't keep up with how fast I shoot. So I then found myself being forced to slow down by the equipment and therefore getting really frustrated with it. And I was just like, well, this isn't, this isn't the right thing for me. And I've wasted thousands upon thousands on it. Um, and so you need to look at how you shoot. For example, a lot of people like shooting on primes, but actually might suit their shooting style a bit more if they were on zooms. And the new Canon RF zooms are as sharp easily as the primes. They are fantastic bits of kit. You know, I, d I don't necessarily go in for the argument of, of zooms versus primes anymore because the optical quality of them is not far off. If you need the vaster aperture and you really want that ultra shallow depth of field, cool, go with primes. But actually, if you're just a general shooter, like I shoot, I would say 95% of my work now on one lens. And it covers almost every single base it's so good like what is that lens that you're using honestly like it's the workhorse i've had throughout my entire career you know i it's the 24 to 70 2 8 right and the and the rf version which i use now is a stunningly good lens it is um you know ultra sharp the the i will say the t stop seems different between the 24 to 70 and the 70 to 200 you know, when I'm shooting interviews side by side, the 7200 looks like it's a full, maybe full stop, less bright. Um, so I would love to see less the F stops and more T stops. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know, T stops is the actual measured amount of light that comes through the lens. So it's the transmission uh, of the light. Um, and so that would be that would be super interesting. But look, if someone was starting now honestly i'd just be like right go and buy an r5 and a 24 to 70 and that's that's hard to argue with i know right here's the here's the thing like the r5 is such an accomplished camera i see everyone from wedding to um to sports to landscape to uh, bird watch i see everyone using it and you kind of go well that's amazing because not only have you got the high megapixel uh you've got lovely big vial but you've got a camera that's capable of what is it I think it can do 20, is it 20 frames a second with the electronic shutter? It can do at least 10 with mechanical. So like, I, I don't know how you'd need more than that. In the early days of my career, I owned a 1DX Mark IIn, which did eight and a half frames a second. And I genuinely thought we'd never get better than that. To have that in the, the R5, you know, I was chatting to, with um, some people at the pub the other night. I was just kind of saying, you know, what, what more do you want from a camera? And they were like, mate, who are you? Why are you, why have you come over to our table? I was going to say, who are you talking to at the pub just randomly about cameras? I think I touched upon this in the, in the last episode, surround yourself with good people, right? And so I've, I've got a couple of really good friends. That I'll go to the pub with every couple of weeks and we'll just, we'll just chat, but we'll have a really, it's really informed chat. You know, we're all at the same level. Um, and it's really it's really nice to just be open and honest. Well, especially with like people like yourself on this, on this podcast, you know, trying to be as open and honest as possible and hopefully save your listeners thousands in, in, in waste, wasted man hours, maybe 
but also just frustration, lost money. None of these system swaps are worth it. Like, honestly. I feel like what part of the reason why I wanted to have this conversation was to try and help people feel more comfortable with where they are now. Like I, I had the R5 and I had the R6 and I, I loved the R5. I absolutely loathed the R6. It, it was one of my least favorite cameras of all time. And largely because of something that I wanted to come onto in a second, which is the convergence of photo and video. The second I started my first commercial job, in-house for a company, I was handed a camera and told to make videos. Like for me, it's been a reality. As long as I've done any kind of commercial work, it's been stills and it's been video. So when I then started to look at cameras with, with the view to both, you kind, of, you kind of want to make sure that you can produce consistent content. And over time, things have changed from like small brand videos where I can stop, start recording. And there came to be an awful lot of interview videos, talking heads like this, recording for online content and courses. And the R6 overheats. And it overheats after around about 20 minutes when it was launched. It improved around about 40 minutes just before they released the R6 Mark II. And then one firmware release and I was right back to 20 minutes again. I mean, I will say uh, that's also why I use the R5Cs. So that's the, that's the exact same thing. If you shoot a lot of video, look at the R5C and don't buy the R5 because, you know, you've got the cooling system and it's the same camera but with, with all the video features you could possibly want false color or you know all the stuff that you don't have available although you do now have false color on the r6 too which is obviously what i'm talking to you now um which is cool right um but the um the r5c is is where i landed and i, th I kind of feel it's maybe where you should have landed as well i i can probably agree with that to to a degree because for me i i tried the r5c and the main issue i had was that a lot of the work that i do is outdoors i do works on farms and i am recording outdoors in bad weather essentially there's, there's one of my clients that's a shepherd and he is regularly like just he has to work all the time and if i'm covering him i'm covering him whatever the weather is and in those situations i can't rig a system out and the issue i had that was with at the time the r5c the battery would run out in about 15 minutes of like actual record time which was just unusable for me and at that point i kind of took the decision that right okay i need to make a decision ended up with the fujis these uh xh2s's and for me, these have been fantastic, but honestly and truly, they've not been as reliable as the R5 was. They've been significantly more reliable than the R6 was, and the image quality from the video is knocking on the level of the R5C, if not slightly nicer, but it, it just does not compete when it comes to stills, to the point where the thing you were saying about medium format, I currently have a GFX set on, on my shelf in the corner of the room, and I love it, for the exact reason you were saying you hated them. Like, I like the fact that camera makes me slow down. It's really quite pleasant. And especially when I'm working on jobs that can be a little bit more kind of slow paced, it's fantastic. But the issue that you hit on is exactly what you said, that there are jobs when you're going to take them on, you need to be nimble. You need to work quickly. And if you only have a few minutes with somebody, you don't necessarily have the time to kind of be futzing with manual focus or dealing with a bad contrast detect system or whatever else, because those cameras aren't built for that. And I think it's it's, it's interesting because obviously you mentioned the medium format cameras. Um, were there any other places that you went to before arriving back at Canon? Oh yeah, so I went so I went phase to Fuji, the medium format, the GFX, the big one, the horrible grey body Fuji. Why'd you do that? Honestly, awful looking thing. Uh, shot lovely pictures, shot lovely video, uh, but didn't shoot any uh, high frame rate video, which is why I then swapped over to Leica, and I moved over to the SL2 system, which is cool, right? Uh, but there was no Capture One support, which was an absolute deal breaker for me. There is now, however, Capture One support after I'd left. Uh, but then I sold the Leicas, went to Sony. And then the Sonys didn't really like the colors. So, uh, and I, I was just not really pleased with what I was producing. And then I swapped all the Sonys over to the R5 when the R5 got released. Um, and then have been R5, R5C um, ever since. It's been a journey. And it's not a journey I would wish upon anyone. Um, because actually I'm finally now at the point where I am creating work that I'm really pleased with again, but it's taken, it's been a, it didn't help that I had this interruption and also then COVID as well, but I'd shot two, I'd shot two personal shoots on the R5 and that was all I had shot on the R5 before going into lockdown. So I hadn't really fine tuned it. I really hadn't kind of got it set up how I like these cameras. And I really wasn't actually that happy with the pictures I'd shot. So I then edited those images for a year through all the lockdowns, 
not really shooting much else because obviously we none of us did. Um, and I just basically we just got myself into a bit of a spiral. Um, and then I, I was convinced that it wasn't a global pandemic that had made my career quiet. I was fairly certain it was my work. And you kind of go, well, that's not quite right, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> Similar experience, essentially. Like for, for me, I'd made the jump from Sony because I'd started shooting video um, on solo and I hated colour grading Sony footage. At the time, they didn't have any particularly fantastic cameras. Moved to the R R6 when that came out, used it on two jobs and kept editing and editing and editing and got to the point where I thought, what is wrong with me? Why, why do these colours look so bad? And actually, it's like you said, you were just shooting in an... In, in, it was one of those shoots where the weather wasn't right. It was one of those shoots where the environment made it difficult to get the results you wanted. And I was proud of the results I made based on the environment I was in. But it does. It really plays in your mind. You think, is there something wrong with the way that I produce work? What am I doing incorrectly? How do I fix it? And there's, I think part of the issue around that is that there's a big kind of machine built that is designed to prey on those feelings of insecurity. There's an awful lot of marketing that goes into producing these cameras where you're meant to feel like you're not good enough and that you do need this newest thing and you do need the latest greatest and without that you aren't sufficient. So I think you're definitely not alone in feeling isolated and feeling like the, the downturn, you're looking for something to blame. Oh, trust me, I am well aware that I am not alone. This is like a super, super common thing, especially through COVID. And, and the trouble is, yeah, you touched on it, you know, the camera industry has got to sell, right? So, and you know, look at all this new stuff that this camera will enable you to do. Well, actually, no, you need to shut up because it's not right. That camera will not enable me to do much more than what my current camera already can, especially if you're talking about cameras like the R5 and the R5C and the X2HS and the new Nikon stuff and the Sony stuff and the, the Leica SL2 has had loads of upgrades with the firmware. You know, all of these systems now, are, like, what more do you really want? Like, I, you know, I would like the depth of field preview button on the Canons to actually show you exposure simulation so you didn't have to have that turned on all the time and you could literally just push the button, see what your exposure was going to be, and move on. That would be great. That would, that would make the cameras almost perfect for me. Very often, a lot of the tribalism that happens around this stuff is now because of tiny little features like that. And the reason people are so willing to switch is that okay, the Sonys are great, the Fujis are great, the Nikons are great, the Leicas are great, which one do I want? And at that point, if Canon's saying, well, we built our entire autofocus system around the idea of the lens always being wide open, and as a result, we can't really show you depth of field preview, and Sony's saying, yeah, you can, you can just switch over to this mode and it'll let you do that straight away, you might then be inclined to make that switch. I just think that's kind of hitting on some of the psychology behind it. You don't want to solve these micro problems when you can adapt to what you have and produce equally beautiful results with maybe 5% more friction. You know, they, they do have like this, these, these tiny issues that when you're using them every day, they become maybe bigger than they are. Um, and the flash thing, yes, I can work around it. I would really love to be able to control it manually because uh, then I think genuinely it would be the perfect camera. But am I moving systems? Absolutely not. And I don't think anyone should as a result of something that small. If you are using a camera from 15 years ago, and you are going to do the jump to mirrorless, well, you've got a lot to benefit from doing that jump to mirrorless. You know, the optics are better. The processing's faster. You know, the, the image quality is is superior. It is. And the sizes, the file sizes are better. You know, you've, got, you've just got so much to benefit. And the autofocus, pff, don't even get me started. It, that is like night and day. So if you are kind of looking at your 5D Mark II, III, IV, and going, well, maybe I should jump to mirrorless, well, yeah, actually probably you should. But stay within the ecosystem, buy an R5 and an adapter, and then use all your glass. Do not do what I did and just get rid of everything in one go and then buy the new system. It's a waste of time, a waste of money, and it will cause you untold stress, especially with the way everything's going in photography. The demands on us are going up. Our rates are going down. And the equipment cost is just not even going up. It is soaring. Absolutely, sort of four and a half thousand pounds now for the R5C. I mean, that that's kind of where it was initially, but normally you'd expect a camera to launch and then reduce in price. That's how it's always happened. Whereas now it seemed like they launch and then maybe the price will stay the same. But most brands have increased prices. Like even for me, like the the thing you just said about the demands on as a photographer is kind of where I wanted to transition to now. Like we we touched on it already, but video is 
becoming more and more essential. Like not necessarily having the kit to do it at the highest possible levels. So you're not going out to buy an Alexa or whatever, but there are going to be requirements on us to produce some form of video content for many of our clients. Because if you want to provide a full service, you need to be offering it in some, in some way, shape or form. Otherwise, they're going to go to another provider who's going to provide video and basically you're going to lose that portion of the budget, which is, which is fine. But I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about how you've seen that convergence happening and how you handle it. Because for anybody that hasn't seen it already, head to Tom's website. He's got some amazing video examples, like mini documentaries of makers in Sheffield and other places and commercial work. And again, all this kind of video stuff. I'm just kind of interested to see how you find that kind of affect your business. What kind of proportion of your clients are commissioning stills and video rather than just stills? If you want a long career, you need to be shooting video. I would say probably. 80%, maybe 70 or 80% of my jobs now incorporate some sort of video element. And I, I win large jobs as a result of me directly shooting video. You know, I overtake people in the, in the pitching process because I'm able to shoot and produce all of this, you know, this video work. And sure, if, you know, there are going to be people who don't, it doesn't, it, it is not easy. And a lot of people simply cannot do it. I see a lot of photographers who are producing quite poor video work and it doesn't come easily to a lot of people i studied film i've loved shooting moving image uh from when i was about 13 or 14 you know i've shot moving image my entire life really and as a result the transition to video for me was uh, an obvious one and it was it was it was relatively easy you know when you get your head around the basics of it it's fairly straightforward. And I think a lot of people struggle. Instead of capturing that moment, you need to understand how the whole film is going to flow. You need to understand how that clip adds to the story. You know, what what is the action in this? As opposed to, you know, if you're doing a stills lifestyle shoot, you might have someone walk up to a counter in a shop, say hello to the cashier and move on. Uh, but you're the only in the still shoot. All you want is that kind of like that very split second when they're kind of interacting, saying, "Yeah, I'd love a coffee." Oh, yeah, I'm having a lovely day, etc. But obviously, for moving image, you need to think about okay, well, how where are they going to come in from? How quick is it going to be to walk up to there? How long do you want them talking? And then you just have to think about so much more because that's just the action within a scene. But then you need to think about how that scene is going to fit into the deliverable, whether it's a whether it is just a clip or if it's a cinemagraph or if it's a, a full on little mini doc film or you know whatever um and, I, and a lot of people's brains aren't geared to be able to shoot both there might be some people here who are like well i've tried it and i can't do it well okay well that's maybe it's not for you then but being able to offer it even even you know if even if you just don't want to do long form there's always there's always ways of being able to offer video. Just make yourself technically good enough to do it because honestly, people are losing jobs because they don't shoot film. And if you can't do it, team up with the DOP and then basically be like, okay, well, look, it's not for me. I can't do it, but I do have a, I have a great team around me. And sell it in and you go, yep, I've got a great team. No worries. We can handle the video aspect of it. No issues at all. And just bring in someone who does it full time. You know, they'll come in on a freelancer basis and then you just, then you can offer it. But I, I don't, I don't think it's a conversation, you know, going back to, you know, if, if anyone is still not shooting video, we're now 10, I mean, when did the 5D Mark II come out? I think it was like 2010, 2008, somewhere in there. Yeah, I mean, we're talking like a long time ago. I remember I, I, I picked up, um, up in New York uh, and I was shooting video for the band the next day when I was on tour with a band. Um, and that was that was Genesis as far as I was concerned. Like from that day forward, I just shot videos. So we're talking about photographers who've done it for a long time. This is not like some new technology. Like if you are still not shooting video, I will be bluntly telling you, you are behind the times. If you want a longevity in your career, if you want longevity in your career, you need to either look at doing it or figure out how to do it. If you need to be, if you need to be asked. Um, and so it's, it's not a, it's not a, um, it's if it's when you need to be doing it. I'm, I'm, I, I'm sure there'll be some people who disagree and they're probably kind of sh shouting at their speaker now, but like, you know, bluntly, I've been doing it for a very long time. I win a lot of jobs as a direct result of doing it. People like the same creative eye over the stills and the mo moving image. I'm able to provide absolutely everything. I'm a kind of a single person production house, really. Um, and so as a result, it's meant that I've become global preferred for various FTSE 100s and stuff like that. You know, we're not, we're not mucking about here. 
you need to be doing it. That's such a strength that you've got in the fact that you've kind of you got on early. Like I just double checked, it's two thousand and eight that that came out. So the fact that you you that you jumped on then is a huge deal. And as well, like it, it kind of speaks to why you like the aesthetic you're getting there. Because one common complaint you get with Canon cameras all the time is, oh, the dynamic range isn't high enough or whatever else. But frankly, like I, I've literally never used a Canon camera for video and thought there's not enough dynamic range here for me to make an image. I've never, I've never sat down and thought, oh, I need more. Give me four stops, and I'll and four stops of dynamic range, and I'll still create something cool, right? Like it, it is, it is just ridiculous the whole dynamic range thing i'm just like guys anyone arguing about, dy about dynamic range are you actually working photographers or are you people just slanging back and forth in the comment section i would argue that probably the latter it's the same guys who moaned on and on about pixels like you just go guys it doesn't matter a good image is a good image you know without being funny like you you know remember that old challenge they used to do they used to do like a ten dollar cha challenge on youtube i can't remember which channel it was on but you'd see people create crazy, amazing images with like a point and shoot Barbie camera. It, it was digital rev, and I can remember. It was so good. You know, give someone basic tools but untold knowledge, and they will create a far better image than someone with no knowledge with the best tools. I'd agree with that. When you kind of work at a certain level, you end up, you know, being surrounded by people at a certain level. And so I've been at these kind of uh, these get togethers and, and I've seen people work and I've gone, that's amazing. And what's, what's amazing about that is that you're doing that on an iPhone or you're doing that on, you know, it doesn't matter. The lighting there is the important thing. What you're shooting on is actually completely irrelevant. You could have shot that on the Fuji S7000 from 2003 or 2004 and it would still look as good because it's not the camera that's at all important in that. And I think everyone always goes on and on about dynamic range. And it doesn't matter. Like, like honestly, it's, I mean, obviously, it does matter. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, before anyone kicks off in the comments and whatnot, I am not saying full stop that it is a complete non-issue. But for the majority of people who are moaning about it, it actually is a non-issue. You know, a lot of these cameras now, you've got 12 and a half, 13, 14 stops dynamic range, and you go up to the arrows, and I think uh, the reds in there are 16 and a half stops. They look fantastic. Like, don't get me wrong. But at the same time, you need to look about what you're creating. If you are creating something for the Super Bowl spot, or you are creating something for Netflix, or you are creating something for, you know, a, a um, you know, something with real budget, well, you're not going to, I won't be shooting that myself. I will have a full team in who are bringing an ARRI or, you know, and, and I will bring in it or do it all properly. But if you are shooting a little personal film, it does not matter if you are missing that extra stop of dynamic range. It doesn't matter because people aren't watching that and going, oh, I wish I had more details in those highlights. People are watching it and going, oh, that's a nice story. Oh, like I can really relate to that person. Or, oh, that's really interesting what he's doing. You know, people aren't going into the shadows and being like, oh, these look a bit blocky to me. <laughs> you know, they're just not. They're just not doing that. I mean, think about it from the other point of view as well. Like you get people shooting mid music videos on, like, DV cameras, like, early 2000s, like, mid, like, home technology. And I think that there's this kind of, like, a branding element to some of this as well. Like, if your only purpose is to make the absolutely cleanest possible image and you need everything to be infinitely available you're going to make something boring because that's not what people are attracted to like how many people like complain about the dynamic range and the sensor and then they go into like final cut or into davinci resolve and complete crush the blacks it's like well what was the point why did you spend all that money on that camera in the first place you don't need it like there was there's a, a videographer a wedding videographer actually philip um philip white and he was sponsored by Sony, and he was on an interview on a panel panel stage for Sony. He was being interviewed by some like YouTube personality, like some videographer, and he said, "Yeah, in camera, just take my blacks and take them all the way down because I want it to look good at a camera." And he got absolutely slated by every other panelist and everybody in the comments. And yet, you look at his videos, and they're amazing, and his clients love them. Like, what, what's the problem? What does it matter? Exactly. If you like the output, who cares? If you are someone listening and going, oh, yeah, that's me. I like leaving nasty messages for people on the internet. Get your camera. Go outside. You go and do it yourself. You know, I've got, I got no time for people on the internet. I meet you in real life, 
and then let's see let's see what you want to say to my face but like you know i'm not i'm not putting up with people kind of leaving comments on the internet i'm just not just not interested not fussed not bothered at all if he's putting out good work and that's how he does it cool leave him to it you know if he's not technically perfect what does it matter i those panels i will say i you because companies not not necessarily obviously i'm not talking about sony here but because a lot of companies pay people to be at these shows and i've been on those panels i've been paid to be on those panels um they are always there's always a kind of a bit of a, an ulterior motive even if there's you're only ever going to get a certain level of honesty it's one of the reasons i've basically resigned from all of my endorsements and resigned from all of my um you know kind of partnerships with brands and stuff i, I had partnerships with so many brands back in the back in the day i was kind of like you know, 25 30 brands i was dealing with and i was just like Do you know what no i want to be able to talk completely freely i want to be able to talk about anything that i want to do uh with with and be completely honest so as of this week i'm resigning the final one um and then you know it can talk completely completely freely and and go back to loving life um but it doesn't matter if if phil wants to put the blacks all the way down and he produces great work well, it's much easier. It's much easier to leave someone a nasty comment and try and bring them down if your work isn't as good as his. And the thing is, if your work is better than his, then chances are you don't care about leaving comments on the internet because you are probably out there shooting some cool work, making mega money and getting all the good jobs. And man, it doesn't matter. Like, here's the thing: money doesn't matter. It does obviously matter to a point. I make these sweeping statements, and then I kind of have to like renege on them slightly. Like, turns out absolutes aren't particularly helpful. I get it, but they sound good, so you keep going. <laughs> Absolutely, money. No, you know, money. Money is is obviously important to a point, but like, if you're chasing money in photography. I've done it. I've been there. I've been, I've I've tried to chase the the checks, and your work suffers. And then what happens is because you're not then doing work that you're pleased with, you're proud of, and that you haven't personally invested in, you're then just trying to please. You're trying to please the market. The market doesn't want you to please it. The market wants to find something cool and unique, and then roll with that. You know, it's it's not like, you know, you're not trying to. Um, if you please everyone all the time, you end up pleasing no one all of the time. So it's, you know, you've just got to make sure you're happy with the work you're putting out and go back to Philip. If he's doing that and that's how he's technically doing it, well, that's cool. He's probably really pleased with it. And also, without being funny, he's pleased with it enough that the Coma Company has gone behind him and gone, yep, yeah, we'll sponsor you. This this is ultimately the thing. So this kind of leads us neatly to the next section. So on your own podcast, on Exposed Negative, you... You talk to Jim Marsden, an amazing photographer, and he's one of... Lovely chap. Amazing guy. Like, I really hope we can get him on here soon. We've talked to him, but maybe later. Um, but one of the things I wanted to talk about is because we're talking about this idea that essentially, if you're going to do this, just pick the industry standard kit and, and move on. But obviously, you've got somebody like uh, Jim Marsden, Andrew Painter, uh, Julian Love to a degree, and like basically a, a whole raft of photographers, Parker Fitzgerald from Ransom Limited, these are all photographers that are using film as like their preferred capture medium. They, they'd rather be using film. And as a rule, the cameras that these guys are using are not going to perform the way something like an R5 or an, or an R6 or any of these cameras are going to work. They're doing a lot less. So considering this idea of an industry standard, how do you see something like that fitting into the world of, world of commercial photography? It's tricky because I don't shoot that way. So I don't know, honestly. I, I, the, the, the way the costs are going up, I don't see it massively viable for a lot of clients. Um, and I don't see it massively financially viable for a lot of photographers. So I don't feel massively great about it, but it, I, it doesn't, it's not, doesn't form part of my workflow at all whatsoever. Will not absolutely even think about it. Um, not interested. So uh, yeah, I, I'm probably not the right person to have an opinion on that because I know there's people I've sp I've spoken I've spoken to a lot of people who do, and they're you know they're all in love with the with the medium and stuff like that. And you go, okay, cool, yeah, great, absolutely. Um, but I'm not in love with the medium. It, for me, it's just faff. So um, you know, and my and my work doesn't suit it. It doesn't. I doesn't. I don't kind of feel like there's 
any advantage for me of doing it and the way I work and the amount of shoots that I do or try to do just means that it, I think the cost of things like that would be completely prohibitive. And I agree with you. And, and it's part of the reason I've not actually shot film for anything for work since about 2017. Because even at that point, we lost the labs. We started seeing a lot of places go. Um, more and more often, we're finding that a lot of these people that are relying on film is that the way that they, they get their visual identity, the way that they, they get their look, they're not doing it themselves, the, the lab tech, the scanner, and there are other people involved that are masters of craft in their own right. And a lot of these, these people are retiring, the machines are breaking down, because there's the other side of it that's not talked about a lot, that things like Noritsu and Frontier Scanners haven't been produced since the 90s, and a lot of them are genuinely wearing out. Um, part of what the reason I wanted to bring it up here wasn't particularly because of the film aspect of it. It's more just that these are people producing work that in by any kind of measurable metric, is worse than the stuff that you can make with even a digital camera from five years ago. Like there, there's no, there's no high frame rate. There's no, there's no incredible eye tracking or subject detection autofocus. In some cases, there isn't even an autofocus. There isn't even a light meter in the camera. But it's the craft, isn't it? So it takes it back, and you go, "Well, what did I say right at the beginning of this?" Well, the cameras don't really matter. It's the craft. It's your skill. It's your expertise. People. The reason we get paid a certain level of remuneration is because what we do is highly skilled i think when we're in it we forget how highly skilled it is but actually it's really highly skilled um and especially you know it, there's a there's a there's a level of which i think a lot of people can attain quite quickly in photography but to then really accelerate and master your craft takes years and years and years and you have to go through so many frustrations and you have to go through difficult shoots dealing with lots of different people and things like that, that actually you come out at the end, not only as a master of your craft, and I, for example, would don't hope that I never master my craft, but you also come out as a, you know, a CEO, you come out as a psychologist, you come out as your CFO, you come out as a marketing expert. You know, it's not just the craft of photography it's also the craft of running a business as well so really when you take a step back and stop talking about the equipment you kind of go well actually that really is a very small part of the business i mean don't get me wrong it's a fairly important part of the business but at the same time it's a very small part of the business so um you know it's yeah i mean it just takes it back all back to the craft and the, and the craft comes in so many different facets being self-employed um that you just i just i just want people to stop fussing about cameras because actually i know we all enjoy them but they aren't really that important this is kind of why i wanted to bring things around to jim because for me he he is one of the people that i know has got a really clear visual identity but it isn't mm -hmm. anything to do with the kit like i don't look at it and think oh this is beautiful because of the color palette I like his approach to thing that like the loose way that he interacts with subjects and it's it's very much the same with your work and part of why I brought this up was that even though you tend to use flash for a lot of your stills only stuff I get the same feeling that I get from a lot of these photographers that I really venerate people that I look to for visual inspiration all the time when I look at your video because that there's a, a subtle shift in the way that you're interacting with things and the way that you're kind of in approaching your environment and the way you light things. And mm. those moves towards a more honest, more natural approach make more of an impact on me than, than anything else, I think. And I think part of the, the reason why a lot of these photographers that stick to film have, have a look is because they're not being constantly distracted by having to learn, like, okay, how do I get the ISO changed on this body? Or like, where is the button that allows me to do such and such an advanced feature because they just don't have it and yeah it limits the scope of work like in a lot of cases photographers that opposite mm. that operate that way aren't going to have you running through like a scene they're not going to do anything that requires that kind of faster tracking without allowing a conversation with the client to happen when they're saying that this is going to be loose and probably out of focus like this, this it's going to look like this and call from previous work and show them what they're going to going to get but I think that part of the reason why I enjoy the photography so much is because of the bravery that goes into having those conversations with people. Like, here is how mm -hmm. your image is going to be imperfect, and this is why. And 
show somebody that and they can then decide whether or not they think it's going to be a fit. I just think that sometimes because digital is focused on having this perfect output, we can be caught up in that. 100%. I mean, it, but the the interesting thing about the, going back to that point about, you know, having those conversations, is those conversations come from experience, right? You cannot pick up a film camera, start shooting commercial work straight away, and then instantly have the breadth of knowledge of someone who's been shooting commercially for 25, 30 years. You just can't. And those conversations that you have with someone who's been shooting for 30 years are going to be very different to someone who's been shooting for five minutes, right? My worry is that when I was young, it seems like a long time ago now, but like when I was young and in college, for example, oh, <laughs> you don't look a day over 22. But the, 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 when I was at college, I could pick up a uh, roll of film for like a couple of quid or I would take it into Boots and I would get a free film you know and it, the cost involves I think I was paying like £4.50 or £6 for processing with prints Sl scans weren't a thing obviously but my point is sorry my point is when I started it was cheap or it was much cheaper than it is now so I found no barriers to exploring there was no like, oh God, that shot's going to cost me one pound fifty. You know, I there was I would just like rattle through films because it didn't really matter that much because the costs weren't massive. Whereas now it makes me really sad that there are going to be people who are going to be really talented photographers. There's going to be some real talent that doesn't emerge as a result of the prohibitive costs of shooting on film and maybe even the prohibitive costs of the latest and greatest equipment. Now, that, on the flip side of that, obviously you can go into your local camera store and buy a, an old 5D Mark II for 300 quid, and they're great cameras. Like, they're, you know, there's, there's, so there's, there's less barriers to entry on the digital side of things. But if you, for example, you know, you're at college and you really want to own a Leica, well, that's unattainable for most people at college because not only have you got to spend thousands on the body, you've got to then spend thousands on the lens. And I didn't have that kind of money when I was at college. And then you've got to spend hundreds getting films processed and buying the films. Like a, a roll of Portra 400 is what, like 24, 25 quid now for 36 exposure Portra 400? And you kind of go, yeah, I'm, I'm an established photographer who's been doing this a long time. And if I'm going, nah, it costs too much, then what hope does someone who really wants to get into photography they're just going to think it's expensive and prohibitive and on the flip side of that as well you once you've spent that money there's no guarantee you're going to get a good result anymore like what the, mm. the time that you're talking about was pretty much when i started like I'd, i remember these films being discontinued my first photography job was working for impossible project the people that resurrected polaroid after polaroid killed its entire business because reasons um <laughs> but the, the the issue was that at that point I could take a roll of uh, 400h Fuji 400h to Boots and get near perfect scans on a Fujifilm Frontier because every mini lab had this cutting edge technology at the time that made these incredible scans and even an inexperienced technician could run it and get great results off the other end of it even with a couple of years experience with somebody that's working in Boots literally in Boots chemist that's like Walgreens for anybody in the states. Um, and it, they look perfect and develop and scan and a fresh roll of film was six pounds. And yeah, the, the, the reason that was useful wasn't just because of the low cost, but it meant that you could learn how you could expose your film and what result you could mm -hmm. expect. Whereas now, even with 10 years plus experience shooting film, there are labs out there that will put the roll in the machine, let it run through and give you whatever the machine spits out. And nine times out of ten, that is not going to give you even anywhere close to the quality that the film's capable of, and certainly far worse than you can get on automatic on a digital camera. And mm. so it's not just the cost side of it. It's, it's costing more for, in most cases, a lesser product than what you would have had a few years ago. 